now i would like to invite our founder and honorable finance minister dr ptr tyagarajan to deliver his special address sir the floor is yours thank you <laughs> thank you very much pugal and darni uh, for organizing this also the team at dpf i apologize i have a bit of a back throat so i probably could not speak for very long uh, but i very much welcome the opportunity to speak and to at least listen for a while uh, before i drop off but um, you know on a topic like this is very hard for me to get started because there's so much to say and i uh, struggle where to begin as with most things i speak straight from my heart or my head so i don't make many notes and so you know i've been trying to frame this uh, in, in the right context so maybe i can start with a bit of a disclaimer the sense that you know each of us saw a different facet of what was otherwise a towering personality that had a huge impact on and on many of our lives in fact on the lives of you know now close to 8 crore tamils and many who went before them so at some sense uh, you know you look at something this large from different perspectives you see different views uh, some things are common some things are unique as far as i'm concerned um i have a picture of me i don't know 6 or 5 or 7 years old in a suit sitting between him and uh, nawlar medjal in, in the same sofa in the same living room of the same house that uh, we still live in in madurai Uh, when he was then chief minister and nawlar was finance minister or oh, now some education minister some big senior minister right after um, anna passed away and kalinga took over or maybe just after the 71 election so my association goes back that far and clearly you know in that sense he was a towering figure i had occasion to meet him many times in my life i was very young boy i didn't understand politics i didn't understand a lot of things so i i probably did not have any deep personal interaction with him till uh, 2006 so that is to say till i was 50 years old or no 40 years old and then the association started because in some sense the passing of my father really um opened up a kind of direct communication uh, which i had not had either the need or the luxury till then and uh, and i remember almost every time i spent time with him um and even towards the end um there were very few people that uh, when he was somewhat incapacitated and he had limited uh, physical mobility there were very few people he continuously either asked or, or liked to see and uh, you know by some uh, affection i was one of them so i used to go and see him quite a bit and talk to him and listen to him and most days he was very lucid Even, even at that age even with those limitations and so maybe i just talk a little bit about two aspects one my understanding of how when the dravidian kind of movement came back to power in 67 after 30 years away and the very untimely and sudden passing of anna how kalingir stepped up to the plate and how those early years in many ways framed him and framed his approach to governance administration and connectivity with the people because i don't think it was automatic that he was going to be the chief minister in fact i don't think anybody expected that aringa rana would pass that quickly so those early years in the cauldron i think really shaped him and i have some comments to say about that and then i want to talk about him as a, as a human being and he had some extraordinary strengths and and a particular kind of uh, um, nature of personal interactions um that was quite unique so you know i know there are many learned scholars here uh, uh, mr panir selvan has written a book so i don't want to um, you know uh, try to attempt an amateurish view when others can give an in-depth perspective so if you take the first one really you know the 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 dmk government of 1967 was in many ways a kind of accidental government i don't think anybody expected in the history of politics in independent india that a party less than 20 years after being formed uh, would come to power with such a sweeping majority and with therefore people who had almost zero experience of ever having been administrators of anything and even then relatively speaking this was a fairly large state with a fairly you know sizable population and economy so i'm sure many of us have heard the anecdote where the congress in disgust accused the government 
of being a third rate government and much in the footsteps of perring uh, rana rather than accept or uh, refute it uh, calling it twisted it and said no no it's not a third rate government it's a fourth rate government because we are all shudras you see we are the fourth level of the hierarchy and uh, you know this was very much in the ways of anna which again you see the the congress had never envisioned the day that they would lose power so you may recall the time when they told anna your days are numbered they didn't know that he was physically you know ill they meant your days are numbered you cannot sustain a government you don't have administrative experience you don't know how to run a state and his response was because my days are numbered my steps are measured so i think in that tradition they came and they really struggled between us if we really look back they struggled to learn the ropes of administration um so quickly but i think it shaped him in many ways because one of the remarkable things about kalinger as a administrator as a chief minister um was his capacity to take inputs from hundreds of sources literally like on a major issue he would consult all kinds of people that we didn't even know who all he was calling he would call and ask somebody at the patasalala level he called some grama mila some uh, you know panchayat um, talaver what do you think he'll call the is officers and he had an extraordinary ability which i think most of you uh, may have seen at some point he could sit for an hour without opening his mouth he could sit and listen to as many people as needed to talk of course there were days when he was impatient he tried to tell him crazy things he'd get angry and shout at him but as long as there was value being um you know added to the meeting he could sit and patiently listen to everybody and many things he was not actually that deeply technically educated in as we know but he had the extraordinary ability the combination of acute listening and judging the personality and capability of people he figured out over time who to take at what value who was more likely to be right who had a greater insight on what subject and so you know he had uh um, two things that he developed very early this democratic approach it's in, in inherently a democratic approach it says let a thousand voices be heard whatever emerges is likely to be the best outcome so he had this democratic approach that he developed by necessity and he had a way with people that helped him figure out uh, who should be listened to at what level i have never met an is officer or an ips officer who worked closely with him of all communities of all political persuasions who has one bad thing to say about working with him once they work together with him uh then you know basically he he allowed them the leeway and he gave them the due respect for their professionalism for their capability i mean he, if he found the wrong people he would change them but otherwise he gave them a lot of uh, support i remember my mama um Pisa Banagam, who was chief secretary, retired the other day. He was telling me that when uh, he went to Talayev's house as chief secretary, he was with tre- trepidation to see how the relationship would work. But they had a wonderful official relationship. And on the day of his retirement, Kalinga uh, said, "Sabana, you will go from both the sale and the house, go home both the number and the house." He knew how to build those kinds of relationships and and uh, you know build the loyalty. that comes out of vesting that kind of trust and faith i think also he went back to the core principles every single time you know we all talked about the right to um, women um, the right, women's right to inheritance of property if you go and read the assembly speech he said in 1929 at the chengalpur justice party conference ptr wp sandra pandey nalla idala pesnaanga adarku yerpa innikku naanga kadamaiye seigrom you know every time he passed a legislation he tied it back to what were the root values and the principles of the justice party of the dravidian movement and how he was an extension and continuing to do the duty of you know the chief minister who was nurtured and schooled by that movement and there are many many examples but again i'll pick up on a point pohal made i think when the justice party was set and when the original governments were set the list of kind of excluded people was not that wide you know we were basically dealing with the hierarchy of the caste first and every time kalinga came to power he had another dimension to add uh, 
about uh, Mata Tirunali or about Tirunangai or about, uh, you know, the people standing outside of other people's house and watching the TV. Therefore, they should have self-respect and get a TV of the housewives cooking with the wood stoves and taking too much time and having health hazards. Therefore, you should give them gas connections. So, you know, as somebody who came from very modest beginnings, he never lost touch with his roots. He lived relatively simply all his life. Most of you know, I don't think he changed his house or he changed his bed or he changed his seat or his way of life, actually. Um, you know, towards the end, he needed a little bit of extra support because of the wheelchair and the special car. And all that. But otherwise, he was not affected by these kinds of things. So, you know, his work ethic was legendary. And based on that combination of profound values and belief, an extraordinary work ethic, and uh, an unique and unparalleled ability to connect with human beings, then it's really fair for us to say that over the many, many years that he was chief minister, uh, that he really shaped the modern Tamil Because, you know, while the ideas came from Peria and while the notion of converting those ideas into a political movement and creating a hierarchy and a structure and a system came from Perirang and Anna. Uh, in the end, execution is everything. You know, every day I speak, I talk about many of us having differences of ideology, difference of philosophy. Yes, it matters. But it only matters to the extent that you can actually execute an outcome and improve the lives of people. Otherwise, it's just your theory and my theory are just both you know, empty vessels, so to speak, or your philosophy and mine. So in that sense, I would say he had an um, uncanny kind of uh, ability to pick the right path at the right time. And he could sense the people's mind, at least in the, you know, in the all but the last few years of his career. He had an extraordinary connect with people. He had an enormous information network. He would listen to everybody and anybody. And he knew, you know, sooner or later, who were the fools and who were the wise men. And especially after he started wearing his glasses, where you couldn't see uh, what the expression on his eyes were. He had this phenomenal kind of poker face, where he, you couldn't tell when you were talking to him whether he agreed with what he says. It's a very, very, very uncommon trait. Most of us don't have that. I'm the extreme opposite of that. You can tell in my face if I agree with or disagree with or I'm, you know, irritated by what I'm hearing. And Kalingar had the exact opposite. He could uh, listen equally to the most, you know, pure wisdom and unadulterated nonsense. And he, you wouldn't see any change in his expression. And uh, there's an there's a, um, old comparison I make that they, they talk about uh, the perfection of meetings with Oppenheimer, the leader of the Manhattan Project, when they were working on the bomb, and how those meetings were the best, most efficient meetings ever heard. Because Oppenheimer would simply sit and let everybody speak. And nobody would have to argue twice, and nobody had to repeat their point. And at the end of six or eight people speaking, Oppenheimer would say, well, I think it's pretty clear now. This is the way to go. The odds are this is going to work. And that was it. So you just take everything, collate it, put it together, come out with the right thing and go out. And I'm reminded of that whenever I think about Kalingar and his ability to frame policy on that. Let me switch a little bit to his uh, personal interactions. In every way, he was always a man who placed uh, affection and uh, the human touch above other things. He was quick to anger. He was even quicker to forgive. Uh, people made a lot of bad decisions and a lot of bad outcomes. He would shout at them. He would kind of castigate them. And then very quickly, you know, he would just overcome that and he would forgive very easily. So I think for him personally, as he told me multiple occasions when my father passed away, when I didn't take the seat, then when I came back, it was very clear to him. He said, you know, posts come and go. Someday you'll be minister. Someday you won't be. Someday you'll be MLA. Someday you won't be. But what you have to commit to me is that you'll always be affectionate to me. You'll always be close to me. And that mattered to him a lot. And I think the older he got, uh, that mattered even more. And unfortunately, that circle of people that would, uh, you know, really uh, penetrate into his, um, you know, affection and, and understanding, especially towards the end, was a limited circle. But you could see the, the joy in his eyes and you could see them light up. And he genuinely was that kind of people person. You know, he, he was that vested in human relationships. And there are extraordinary number of individuals whose entire careers in politics, in industry, in academia, in the judiciary, whose entire careers 
even some of them brilliant careers have been built solely on the fact that Kalangir decided to invest in them or decided to promote them or decided to give them an opportunity. The list is endless. Of course, one of them is me in the sense that uh, after having declined many, many opportunities to come back, when I went in 2016 without batting an eyelid, uh, he offered me the seat. And uh, every time I went to see him, I felt that warmth, I felt the affection. And, uh, and of course, I miss it a lot. But, you know, administrators, there are many good administrators. Um, people who can translate policy to outcomes, not so many, many, many fewer than that. People who can translate policy to outcomes and affect the lives of so many people, even fewer than that. People who can do all that and stand as a shining example in a country of, you know, 1.4 billion people, it's hard for me to think of any other person. And then above all that, imagine what uh, the, the warmth of his friendship and relationship should have been. If I say that beyond all that, what stays with me is the personal interactions and the way he treated you and, uh, you know, the jokes he cracked and the kind of questions he asked. So um, it's a bit of an emotional uh, day for me, uh, partly because that, partly because my voice is so poor. Uh, I won't go much deeper into the into the administration, the technical stuff. There are many wiser people than me here who can comment on that. But let me uh, thank you for the uh, chance to be here. Uh, I really uh, am happy to participate. I think this is a very important event. If nothing else, for those of us here to have this opportunity to reminisce and uh, pay our respects and honor the memory of uh, certainly uh, indubitably the architect of modern family. Thank you.